checking all of the boxes, and keeping the price low, this is the Google Pixel 5. Hey s'mores, I'm Shannon Morse, welcome to Morse Code. I do tech reviews and tutorials, so if you are looking for in-depth tech and gadget content, you've come to the right place. This is the new Google Pixel 5. It comes in just black or sage green, I have the sage green version, for $699. It's available through Verizon on their 5G wideband, or you can also get it carrier unlocked. I'm using mine on Google Fi. It's the same MSRP either way, no matter where you buy it from. Now included in the box, there's an 18 watt USB-C power adapter, a three foot long USB-C to C cable. There's the SIM ejector tool and obviously the phone. The release date for this, it's available October 15th in several different countries and it lands in the US on the 29th. This is kind of interesting and I will tap on it so you can get a sense of what it feels like. This is a bio resin coating. Can you hear that? It's so weird. And it's also a 100% recycled aluminum enclosure, which I love. They also put a Gorilla Glass display on the front. The dimensions of this phone are 144.7 millimeters by 70.4 millimeters by eight millimeters. So it's ever so slightly larger than the 4A. It weighs 151 grams, which is insanely lightweight. So it's really easy to carry this around and barely notice that you have it in your hand. As far as ports and buttons go, you have USB-C 3.1 Gen 1, on the bottom, there's also your power and volume on the right side, and there's a nano SIM slot as well. This also includes waterproofing at IP68, which is great. I think it feels comfortable to hold. It's very easy to use single-handedly because it is small, and I think it's very understated and simple. It's a simple design. The chrome finished sage green G and the power button are a nice little touch, and I do like that it's kind of shiny. It gives it a little bit more of a premium feel. It is very thin and lightweight, and even the camera bump on the back is super minimal. It's barely there. The fingerprint sensor is again on the back, so they did bring that back. I would have preferred an in-screen fingerprint sensor personally, but the back one works just as fast as the previous models do. The display is six inches on the dot. It's full HD+, 1080 by 2340. It's an OLED screen, and it hits 432 pixels per inch. The aspect ratio is 19.5 by nine and it does support HDR as well as that always on display that we have grown to love. Now what I like is they put a 90 hertz refresh rate inside the screen which is super super fast and really beautiful. The lower resolution is not that noticeable on this small of a phone so I really don't mind. 90 hertz is very smooth and it's a very worthy upgrade from the regular 4a if you choose to upgrade. As far as the nits brightness goes I don't have the equipment myself to test that but I have seen reports saying that it's over 600 and it does get very dim as well at night. The bezels on this are very thin and it's got a nice flat screen so it's really easy to do gestures and edge swiping. I've had no problems with that and it does not respond whenever my palm hits it in the corners so I was pretty happy with that as well. Now for the cameras. We will talk about the rear cameras first. We have a 12.2 megapixel f 1.7 aperture lens. It's a 77 degrees field of view lens with a 1.4 micron pixel size. There's also a 16 megapixel ultra wide, so you do get an ultra wide, which is great. It's an f2.2 aperture, 107 degree field of view, and a 1.0 micron pixel size. Unfortunately, there is no ultra zoom, but you can go from a very ultra wide view for landscapes to about seven times digital zoom. Panoramas, Photosphere, Google Lens are all built into the classic Google camera app. There's also slow motion, and time lapse, which are also available. The social sharing button is totally customizable. It quickly lets you access social apps to share a picture. I think it's really cool whenever I take a photo, I can just quickly share it over to Instagram. Also, when taking a photo, night mode can be automatically applied if photos are in a dark environment. It'll just naturally take a night mode photo instead. And the leveler found in this phone, which is also in the 4A, really, really helps pick stay level. And I love that because I'm always crooked in my pictures. Also, portraits can now be taken with a night sight, and that is such a cool feature. The new portrait light can be found under the edit option. Just go over to adjust and choose portrait light. I think this thing is some kind of weird wizardry. It's like having a bounce light without all the bulk of carrying around an actual bounce light. It works on portrait mode photos, and it works on photos of multiple people. It makes it look 
look like there's a bounce light redirecting the sunlight to give you less harsh shadows. And that's kind of the best way I can describe it, but it's, it's really cool. It's super cool. I can find myself using this all the time. Raw is also supported. Night sight photos are very impressive. They still manage to capture colors and some details, although there is a little bit of noise present. Portraits in night sight do work surprisingly well. And I do want to test this feature out some more over the coming week too, because I've only had a few days with this phone so far. Colors have a natural hue to them. They are not oversaturated or crazy vibrant. They are just realistic. HDR does a fine job of capturing details in the shadows and not blowing out the sky. So you can see, for example, the mountains and the low set clouds behind me. The contrast looks really balanced in this picture. Using the ultra wide was pleasant too. The edges did have a slight curve, but they were not distorted like they were on my Fold 2, for example. Overall, I was really happy with the cameras. There's great detail, natural colors, and it's very well balanced. The new ultra wide definitely piqued my interest, and I'm happy to report that it creates great looking photos, especially when I was looking at them up close on my computer screen. For video recording, you can do up to 4K 60. Vids only zoom into five times digital zoom, but it's so grainy, I don't know why you would ever want to do that. The front camera is eight megapixels, f2.0, 83 degrees field of view, with a fixed focus lens, and it's 1.2 12 microns pixel size. Now, similar to my experience on the 4A, it still had trouble with my hair in portrait mode, but selfie illumination, face retouching are all disabled, but they can be enabled in the settings. I do prefer wider selfie cameras or having that option for group selfies, assuming that we can eventually hang out with people in groups again, ha, huh, in the future, that would be nice. It's wide enough for two people though, so you can definitely take some cute pictures with your SO, for example. You can also take night mode portrait on this camera as well, so that's fun. The video recording was up to 1080p 30. As for the internals, you get eight gigs of RAM. There's 128 gigs of storage. There's no SD card support, and there's a Qualcomm Snapdragon 765G, as well as an Adreno 620 GPU. Now my 3D Mark test score came out to 2283 with Slingshot Extreme. My gaming experience on here was great. I had no issues. It was super fast. It was responsive whenever I was playing games like Elder Scrolls Blades. The Pixel 5 comes with Android 11 and it's vanilla Android straight from Google. And I gotta say, it's all about the software, my friends. Now playing crash detection, call screen, the new hold for me is all included on here. So there's tons of features. You can also do the live transcribe and recording on here. Everything that was recently made available in the past year. Bloatware is pretty much non-existent. It just comes with the Google apps pre-installed and that's about it. There's the usual suspects and nothing surprising. For security, you get the Titan M chipset on here as well as three years of updates. And other than the fingerprint sensor, I did want to mention too, there is no face unlock. So you can't use any kind of face unlock here. If you do purchase a Pixel 5, you also get three months of Google One, 100 gigs of storage online, which is also pretty nice. Now let's go ahead and move over to the connectivity. For Wi-Fi, you get 2.4 and 5 up to AC. There's Bluetooth 5.0, NFC, Google Cast. You also have stereo speakers on here and it supports AppDex, AppDex HD, and LDAC. Now I will say, I think the speakers are kind of tinny. The top one is located under glass while the bottom one shoots out directly towards the bottom. And I do think that because that top one is under glass, it does come out to be kind of tinny and there's really no bass. It's definitely not my favorite pair of speakers. So I've definitely found myself using the Google Buds, which they also sent out to me and I will be reviewing separately. That's a whole nother story right there. <laughs> the battery in here is 4080 milliamp per hour. Quoted minimum is 4,000 milliamp per hour. And it does include wireless charging using Qi. There's also reverse wireless charging, which is included. And it's really easy to enable that. You just go into your settings and you switch over to battery share and then you can stick something on the back of it and charge that additional item. Now I did want to check the battery live while I'm recording. Um, I've only had the phone for a little less than a week so I like to give phones at least a week so I can kind of figure out what the screen on time is going to look, look like for a long-term use. Uh, I have been using this as my full day phone today and I'm sitting at 79% and it's about 4 p.m. right now. 
and it looks like my screen usage since full charge was three hours and 30 minutes so far. And most of that, of course, is with YouTube. So I will take some screenshots so you can kind of get an idea of how long this will last for a whole day, but I should have more reliable information in the coming weeks once I've gotten really hands-on with this device. It is fully compatible with the Google Pixel wireless charger, which I think is cool because you can make it turn into like a little slideshow of your pictures while it's sitting on the charger, for example. When you do plug it in for wired charging, you get about 18 watts fast charging. Now, if you want the best Android camera, the fastest security updates, the up and coming software features before any other Android smartphone, get a Pixel. This one comes with all of the check marks for a flagship, but there aren't a lot of options. There's only two colors. There's no like Max or Fancy Pro option with like six lenses or anything like that. There's no XL version at the moment. It does not shout premium, but I think that it's an understated champion. The software on this thing is premium and so are the cameras. But should you buy it? That's always the big question. And a really big question this year for a lot of people is which one is better, the Pixel 5 or the Samsung S20 FE? I will do a full comparison video of both of those, but TLDR, the Pixel is consistently better in terms of camera and photography. It's got vanilla Android, it's got fast updates, it's secure. But the S20 FE has major features like a micro SD card slot and more color options and the screen is bigger. It's a personal preference and it's a personal taste. I am curious though, if you would choose the Pixel 5. So if you are new here, subscribe, become a part of our amazing community, check out my Patreon and buy me a coffee links down below and comment down below and let me know what you think of the Pixel 5. I am insanely curious and I will be doing more tests with the camera as well as some comparisons. Thank you again so much to my s'mores for subscribing and watching. I'm Shannon Morris, and I will see you soon. Bye, y'all!